So it's my great pleasure, uh, pleasure to introduce Luis Haspal, who's here uh, um, working with me and Makoto um, on a new project here. Uh, so she told me that she has a slide for self-introduction, so I won't go through her biographic details right now, uh, but I did want to quickly introduce the TSVP project that she's working on with us. Um, so both she and her are very new to this, um, but what we're trying to do is to use machine learning uh, to design new polymers uh, that can be used for electronics applications. Uh, so I'm very excited to have her here so that uh, we can embark on a new area of research uh, for us. Um, but anyway, today she'll be talking more about her primary area of research, uh, which is to do with designing membranes, uh, polymeric membranes for a variety of applications. Uh, so I'll just hand over to her. So thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction. So I'm um, very happy to, uh, to be here today to talk about how to tame your membrane and more specifically how to bring specific properties to your polymeric membranes to reach various applications. So, um, how, so it's a really short introduction of my background. So I got my PhD in 2013 in the PBS laboratory and uh, I was working on the synthesis of amphiphilic um, polymer from linseed oil. This uh, kind of uh, amphiphilic polymers has uh, um, a lot of application and uh, more specifically in uh, drug delivery. So I joined the laboratory of uh, Kataoka Sensei in Tokyo University and uh, for a postdoc position. And I was working in the also um, drug delivery systems. And then I joined the uh, INES uh, of Paris in uh, 2016. And finally, I got a, a permanent position um, in the University of Rouen in PBS laboratory. Uh, and so, uh, so Rouen is in Normandy. That's a really nice, sorry, really nice uh, area in France. So we have the sea and also the cliffs. And when I said to my colleagues that I was going to Okinawa, a lot, a lot of people told me how lucky I was. So I, I quite agree with them. And I did some research about the weather. And in Normandy, we, ha we are complaining a lot about the rain. So uh, in fact, uh, I saw that in Normandy, the, the rain, we have uh, around eight, uh, 800 millimeter per year of rain. And the average annual temperature is around 11 degrees. So I had a check in Okinawa, and I think we could not complain anymore about the rain. So uh, as you say, as you know, um, the travel can, uh, as, um, will open your mind, and I think I will not complain anymore about the rain. So anyway, so I am from Rouen in Normandy. That's uh, here a picture. It's a city near the, the La Seine, a nice river. You can see here the nice cathedral, and we enjoy also a really nice middle-aged city center. And uh, my university is in the top of the hill, and we can see my lab just here. I am from the PBS laboratory, laboratory for polymers, biopolymers, and surface. And there is two main axes in this lab. The first one is polymers and living interactions. There is three teams in this uh, axe, which uh, will work in complex colloidal systems, biofilms, and biomaterials and matrix models for tissue adaptation. The second axe will focus on high-performance polymers and is made of two teams, macromolecular material themes and polymers barrier and membranes and membrane materials team. And I am from this team. So what are we doing in this team? So we design and characterize the polymer materials with the control transport property. So I put here a cross section of uh, the pictures of this cross section of a polymer film. You see it's completely porous here. It just for uh, give you an example of kind of membrane we are working on. And we will study how small molecules like CO2 or O2 or uh, nitrogen or CO2 will go through the membrane. Some of them will go fast, some of them will not go through uh, or slower. And we like also to encapsulate um, molecules of interest inside the membrane 
and we will see how it can diffuse outside the membrane. So we will study the permeation and subsection properties. We will study the barrier properties, also the material selectivity, and we will do modelization about that. There is a lot of different applications. We so uh, like energy storage, water treatment, depollution, purification, like a dialysis system. Uh, there is also a lot of application in food packaging or in gas separation, also in biomedical application like bondage. Uh, but uh, first, what is really a membrane? So a membrane is a thin a film of polymer, and you have which separates two fluids. Here you have the feed, uh, which is um, in which we will find. Uh, different molecules here, a big red, a big yellow molecules and small red molecules. And this membrane will uh, avoid the yellow molecule to go through to, to, to it, but it will let pass the red molecules. So at the end, we will have a retentate full of yellow molecules and a permeate full of red molecules. The motor process separation can be uh, diverse, like pressure change, concentration change, or electrical potential change. So we are using the uh, notion of permeability P, uh, which is the capacity to, of a molecule to go through this side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. This uh, permeability um, is described by two different mechanisms the solubility S and the diffusion D. The solubility S will uh, describe the capacity to the molecule to be absorbed or to condense uh, at the surface of the membrane. And the diffusion is the capacity to the molecule to go through and to move inside the membrane. So the permeability is the product of the solubility S and the diffusion D. So here you can see a completely different membrane, which is completely dense. So there is three main types of membrane. The first type of membrane is a dense, a dense membrane, which is completely uh, homogeneous on the thickness. You see here two, picture of, uh, two pictures of the membrane, of a dense membrane, and there is not a lot to, think, to see because it's dense, so we know we, it's completely gray. And uh, here you have a porous membrane, which is also homogeneous in the thickness of the membrane. And you can see here and here in the cross section, all the pores and uh, inside the membranes, and you can see how well they are interconnected with each other. And the last type of membrane is asymmetric membrane, which is here heterogeneous in the thickness, is uh, composed of two parts. Here you have the dense layer of the membrane, and then you have the porous part. So here I just present the um, cross section of, the, of an asymmetric membrane with here the dense part of the membrane and here the porous part of the membrane. And uh, I took this picture to show you also different aspects of pores. We have here a uh, finger-like pores. So to, uh, to have these different kinds, of, these different types of membrane, we will use different processes. So there is a lot of different processes, so I will just present you some of them. To do dense membrane, we will use, for example, extrusion or the hot press, and to uh, elaborate porous and asymmetric membranes, we will use, for example, non-solvent induced stress separation. We can find the water-induced stress separation or the vapor-induced stress separation. I will explain you a little bit more how this one is working. So in fact, we will prepare a polymer solution in a solvent, in a really good solvent of the polymer. And we will cast the polymer solution in the glass plate. This glass plate will be plunged in, uh, in a non-solvent bath of the polymer. Often, it is water and we will let it for one hour or more in the non-solvent uh, non bath to let the polymer coagulate in the, the glass plate. And after rinsing uh, the membrane, we will 
recover this kind of membrane. We, we can also play uh, with some progen agents to uh, reach different types of pores. As a progen agent uh, will be added in the polymer solution, so it should be soluble in the solvents of the polymer, and it should be also soluble in the water because when we will merge the glass plate into the water, the progen agent will diffuse through the polymer, it will be removed to reach the water, and it will form um, nice pores. So with these different techniques, we will, uh, we will uh, elaborate different types of, um, of membrane uh, from atomic range to macro range, and we will be able to, to separate different types of, uh, of molecules of particles like uh, gas or uh, proteins or bacteria. So uh, the membrane function will depend on three big um, condition. It will depend on the, of course, on, uh, on the polymeric membrane properties, also in the, on the process conditions and also on the fluid properties that we want to, to work on. So before starting to present uh, my different projects, uh, I, will, I would like to give you some definition. So first, I will talk uh, sometimes about crystallinity. Crystallinity is a polymer zone with a long range order or an area where the polymer chains are well aligned. That is the difference uh, to the amorphous area. And there is some, um, uh, some more characteristic, characteristic which are um, important to define uh, for the crystalline part and the amorphous area, like the glass transition temperature. This is the temperature at which an amorphous region is transformed between the glassy and rubbery state. Uh, I will talk also about the plot point temperature. This is really a specific temperature because some polymer are miscible in water below a certain critical temperature. But when we reach this temperature, the chains will collapse and it will become um, non-miscible anymore. So we'll talk also a little bit about barrier property so that the capacity of the polymer to prevent or to limit the flux of materials through the membrane, which is the opposite of the permeability. And we will talk a little bit also of porosity, which is the presence of pores inside the membrane. So how to bring specific properties to polymeric membranes to reach various applications? I will show you three examples. The first one is uh, with nanostructuration. I will show you how we could nano to do uh, the nanostructuration uh, on a dense membrane for food packaging application. The second one is the introduction of specific molecules, and we will focus on the porous membrane for this, um, this second point. And the last point is both is the nanostructuration and the introduction of specific molecules uh, for drug delivery application, and uh, it will be on an asymmetric membrane. So the first uh, part with nanostructuration, so it will, uh, we will um, talk about dense membrane for this part. And uh, we study here the impact of nanostructuration of two polymers on barrier properties. So um, why we did this project? So as you know, uh, polymeric membranes are widely used for, for example, food packaging because it's light, they are strong, we have good mechanical and thermal resistance with it, and uh, they present also good barrier properties. It's um, a low, a good storage, it will protect against surrounding, it uh, helps to keep the aroma, and it presents also really good moisture and girls barrier. But most of these membranes, these polymeric membranes, are uh, from uh, petroleum-based polymers. And we try progressively to replace all of this kind of polymer by bio-based bio -based polymers. Uh, here you see the principal polymers that we can use in food packaging. They have a high ecological footprint. It's also high barrier property. 
And when we try to use bio-based polymer, polymers, the ecological footprint is better, but of course the barrier property is, is uh, lower. In, uh, for bio-based polymer, we will uh, talk about polyacid lactic and polyamid 11 here. So our um, goal here is to improve barrier properties of bio -suit polymers by multilayer technique. So uh, one way to improve the barrier properties is to increase the crystallinity degree. Why? Because when you have in a, in a polymer membrane, crystal structure, it will add some tortuosity to the molecule to go through the whole membrane. So one uh, way to increase the crystallinity degree is to play on the confinement effects. For that, we will use two polymers. The polymer one will confine the polymer two inside two layers of polymer one. And we also, in the literature, we saw also a really nice effect when you decrease the layer of the polymer two uh, between two layers of polymer one, you will also um, force the crystal to take uh, a specific orientation. And that uh, will help to improve the barrier properties. So we choose to work with the PA11 as a P1 and the polyacid lactic as P2. For that, we use a specific materials uh, I think there is a thing in the world, six on the world of this uh, kind of extruders. And we have a collaboration in a lab uh, in Paris team uh, to, uh, to use uh, this kind of extruder. And so this extruder is made of different parts. You have the extruder A here, we, um, which will uh, conduct, extrude the PA11. And in this one, the extruder B, we will have the PLA, which would be conduct or extrude. Uh, here. As you can see, the PLA will be injected inside the P PA11. And in this part, we will have what we are calling the multipl multiplying elements. So one multiplying element will cut the flux of polymer in two. So more we add multiplying elements, more we will increase the number of layers. So if we keep the thickness of the film uh, constant, we will decrease the thickness of the layers inside the membrane. So we try, we try to do that, and we first try with or first zero multiplying elements. And you can see here the PA11, the PA in, uh, inside the two uh, layers of PA11, and we did the same thing with six multiplying elements, which um, give us more than 100 layers. And we have the succession of PA11, PLA in uh, yellow, PA11, mm -hmm. PLA. And just like this, we can reach a, a thickness layer of PLA less than 400 nanometer, which is quite good. And so we checked on the interface to see what we have. And uh, we can see here that we have really nice favorites, so really, uh, nice crystals. So with these two uh, films, we got homogeneous and continuous layers, and we have the presence of crystal structure. We have an increase of the crystallinity degree that we, is favorable to increase the barrier properties. So we would like, we wanted to push our lock a little bit further, and we will try. We we tried with ten um, multiplying elements, uh, which means to reach two, more than 2,000 layers and a theoretical PLA thickness layers around 25 nanometers. So we uh, get this result here. So you can see a good succession here of PA11 and PLA. We nearly don't see the layer of PLA because it's really thin. But as we, you can see here that we, we start to have a really huge layer of PA11 and the um, larger PLA. So, and we got also this kind of structure, which is nodules of PLA inside the layer of PA11. And also we have layers break up. So unfortunately, 
uh, we we obtain heterogeneous uh, and irregular layers. We have the presence of nodules, so it will not be favorable to increase the barrier properties for this one. Anyway, we 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 had to try. So uh, I will not show you here the uh, the results, the data of the barrier property because it's not so easy to understand like that. But I will give you the conclusion. For the monolayer, the PA11 is more barrier to water than PLA, uh, but is less barrier to gas than PLA. And so I will not talk about the, the last one because the, the layers of PLA was not good enough. But for the 0M and 6M, we, uh, the membranes was more barrier to water than P11 alone. And we saw a slight improvement barrier properties of multi-layer films compared to monolayers. And uh, more interesting, when we look on the permeability of the PLA inside the layer, so inside the multi-layer film, we saw that the uh, permeability value increased. So when the PLA is confined, in the multilayer membrane. So that's the part for only the nanostructuration. Now the second part on the, the introduction of specific molecules. So for this one, it will concern the porous membrane. So here we uh, synthesize a dual sensitive polymer for the conception of stimuli sensitive membrane. So uh, the um, the goal here, our purpose here, was to elaborate similarly responsive membranes. So, uh, how does it work? Um, you have here a porous membrane, uh, and this membrane has specific size of pore, and uh, this size of pore will let the green only the green molecules to go to, to get through this membrane. And in fact, what we want to do is to uh, modify the surface of the pore with a stimuli-sensitive polymer, which uh, can uh, uh, can change its conformity uh, with a trigger like pH or temperature of UV light. And like this, we can control the size of the pore of the membrane and uh, to let also the red molecule to go through when we want. So this kind of porous membrane is called with dynamic effect, a dynamic valve effect, sorry. And to, uh, to elaborate this kind of membrane, we need to graft a stimuli responsive polymers onto the porous surface. There is different triggers that we can use, pH, temperature, and light. So um, in the literature, to show you more how it's worked, uh, Alexander Boschko in 2014, uh, 14, um, uh, graft the uh, poly and isopropyl acrylamide uh, chains onto a nanoporous silicon nitride membrane. And this kind of polymers uh, is thermosensitive polymer. That means below uh, critical temperature, the chains of penipalm are well extended in the water, so the pore will be closed. Okay. And uh, when we uh, reach the, the, this critical temperature, the chain will collapse and, and the pores will open and let get all the molecules go through. So like this, we can control the small molecules diffusion. So me, I was more interesting to use light, light as a trigger because it's fast, a local and a neutral trigger. Uh, a most commonly used molecule uh, for, um, uh, to use this, tr this uh, trigger is azobenzene. Because under UV radiation, azobenzene will switch from the trans configuration to the cis configuration. And it will lead to a change of the size of the molecule. So it will decrease the size of the molecule and it will increase the polarity of the molecule. In the literature, we can see another application for this molecule is the control of a thermosensitive polymer. So thanks to a change of polarity, we will use it to shift the cloth point temperature. So I will explain it a little bit further. So uh, to uh, determine the cloth point temperature, we are using the UV visible spectroscopy. Here you have like a, a thermosensitive polymer with the azobenzene molecule here. And, in, uh, and if we 
uh, follows the absorbance against the temperature, we will have this kind of um, uh, of spectrum uh, of results. Sorry, that means here uh, we are under the critical sorry the critical temperature. So the polymer is miscible in water, and here is not miscible anymore. But when we will irradiate the 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 polymer in UV light, the azobenzene will shift to the cis configuration, and the whole chain will uh, have will uh, have an increase of polarity. So it will shift the cloud point temperature to higher temperature. So what I want to do is to have this kind of system and to be, for example, at this temperature and like this, if I change uh, in visible light, the polymer will be insoluble in water. And if I, I irradiate it in UV light, it will become soluble in water. So uh, the purpose is to, to obtain a dynamic control of the flux and dynamic control of the selectivity. But first, we need to synthesize a new, uh, synthesize a new photosensitive polyoxazoline polymers. And we want to have an easy and controlled introduction of the azombazin molecule onto the polymer chains. So first, we synthesize a new, we synthesize a new oxazoline monomer. <coughs> And we did NMR and mass analysis to uh, prove that we uh, get the, to verify to check that we have the good molecule. And then we engage this molecule in a uh, copolymerization with azopropyl oxazoline because polyazopropyl oxazoline is a uh, well-known thermosensitive polymers. And we, we synthesize a range of uh, copolymer from 0% of azobenzene oxazoline to 24% of the, this uh, monomer. Uh, and all these copolymer um, are around the same molecular way. So I checked if I could have this shift of cloud point temperature, and I got this result. So for this, uh, the homopolymer, so without azobenzene in it, we can see that the temperature, the cloud point temperature is constant. But as soon as we add uh, a small amount of azobenzene on the chain, we can see a nice variation of the cloud point temperature uh, in UV light or visible light. And if we add more azobenzene oxazoline uh, in this copolymer, we can see that the shift becomes higher. So at this point, I, I think, okay, uh, I managed to have this control of the cloud point temperature in aqueous water. But maybe I can also control some other properties in other uh, environments. So I try in vapor, um, in vapor environment, and we check the water absorption capacity of this of this polymer in uh, in vapor. So at a different humidity rate, and in fact, what we can see is the the cis uh, configuration of this copolymer is able to um, to absorb more water than the trans configuration. And, uh, and this is uh, explained by the fact that the azobenzene in cis form so will increase the polarity, but it uh, will uh, increase also the free void inside the, the chains. And uh, so I try also to, to see if I can control another property, but in uh, powder with just using the um, um, the copolymer in powder, and I check the impact uh, of the UV light on glass transition temperature. So to to just to remind, uh, the glass transition temperature is the temperature at which an amorphous region is transformed between the glassy and the blurry state. So for each uh, copolymer, I check first the glass transition temperature. And as we can see, the glass transition temperature is increased uh, when we increase the amount of azobenzene because we are decreasing the chain mobility uh, with the incorporation of azobenzene. And then I try on two copolymers to, to um, irradiate them in UV light and to, uh, do the, to uh, determine the glass transition temperature. And we can see a nice shift of this DG, the TG 
in this configuration, and we have a decrease of the glass, uh, the glass transition temperature, nearly of uh, 30 degrees here and 40 degrees here. So with this kind of uh, copolymer, we can, with the light, control the glass transition temperature, so in powder, the cloud point temperature in aqueous environment, and also the water absorption in a vapor environment. So there is a lot of different applications we can reach to, uh, to obtain self-filling materials, anti-filling membrane, to have a, a control of the release of molecules of interest, and so on. So now the last one is the nanostructuration and the introduction of specific molecules. And for, for this one, I will talk about the drug delivery system for quadric bone, and it will be for asymmetric membrane. So here we develop an asymmetric membrane with antibiofilm properties for chronic bones treatment. So 80% of chronic bones are associated with the bacterial biofilm formation. And as the presence of this biofilm will reduce drastically the, the effect uh, of and the efficiency of the antibiotic. So the biofilm is a major obstacle to the wound healing. So the purpose here to, was to develop an ideal wound dressing, which will show appropriate mechanical properties, a multiporosity, and which will be select, uh, selective for water vapor gas exchange and avoid the bacteria to, uh, uh, to go through. So for that, we use, so we uh, elaborate a symmetrical polymeric membrane and we use that uh, I presented before the, um, the water induced phase separation method. And we elaborate uh, three type of membranes with just PBEC alone. PBEC is a biodegradable and biocompatible polymer, which is polybutylene succinate cobutylene adipase. And uh, here we use two different uh, pollen agents, PVP, which is polyvinyl pyrrolidone, and PEG, which is polyethylene glycol. And you can see here on this picture that we have uh, the dense surface here, which will protect against external infection the wound. Here we have different porous um, parts, which uh, um, will help to uh, to encapsulate and release an antibiofilm. And here we have the picture with uh, where we can see the dense part and the porous part. So we study the porosity of each um, membrane. And we thought that when we use, uh, when we use um, progen agent, we will increase the porosity, which will be helpful to have a, a reservoir effect. And we are increasing also the interconnectivity, which will be also good to increase the, the release of the antibiofilm. And also, when we have a look on the distribution, we can see that we have um, different range of pore. We have micro, micro, and nano pores. So it will be uh, helpful to have a short, mid, and long release of the antibiofilm agent. So we uh, load, encapsulate um, a protein, which is a IFTC BSA. We managed to load nearly uh, around three micrograms uh, in, per uh, square centimeter. And we saw here in the pictures that the BSA is every, everywhere in the dense part, but also in the porous part. You can see there is some lighter part and brighter part, so it's not of homogeneous in the thickness, but it's everywhere. And we study the release of this protein uh, uh, on uh, 24 hours, over 24 hours. And you can see that for the PBSC and PBSC PVP, we reach nearly 70% of release uh, at 24 hours. But for PEG, PEG uh, it's uh, around 40%. So we have different pharma co-kinetic behavior uh, for this different membrane. And finally, we try to, uh, to check on, on a biofilm, the efficiency of this membrane. So we load the dispersion B, which is an autobiofilm agent in the PBSM membranes. 
And we, uh, we saw that we uh, reached an 84% of biofilm inhibition for the PBAC PVP membrane. So all of these projects needs a lot of experiments. There is some success, of course, uh, but uh, there is also a lot of failures. Uh, we said that chemistry is 10% of inspiration and 90% of perspiration. And that Christine knows that also because she needs also a lot of experiments to synthesize conductive polymers. And even if we are not exactly in the same field in polymer chemistry, we are asking um, ourselves the same questions. Which experiments are the more promising or on which monomer or polymer should we focus our efforts? So for a conductive polymer, uh, we, uh, we have a donor part and acceptor part. In an ideal world, we will have a physical model which can give us a predict the charge mobility. So the life like this will be easier. We will have directly the prediction of the charge mobility for each donor and acceptor corpus, and we can do um, a screening in silico, which will be possible. And then, oh, job done. However, we don't have this physical model. We don't have the access of this physical model. But, uh, but in the literature, there is a lot of different data uh, with different co uh, conductive copolymer with different couple of donor and acceptor and with different charge mobility. And why not using this all this data and to uh, have a nice data set, which we group all this couple of donor and acceptor with this uh, charge mobility here. So if we have the physical model, we should we could have a function uh, which will give us for each couple the charge mobility. But so we don't have uh, this uh, this physical model. So. Uh, but what we can do for unknown couples. So that uh, we would like to uh, use machine learning technique to have an approximation of uh, this function and uh, to predict like this, the charge mobility. So this is an interdisciplinary collaboration with Christine, Makoto Yamada and Florian Ige. So thank you for your attention. Great, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, I guess I can kick things off. Um, so at the beginning when you were talking about your PLA and PA11 layers, um, you showed the example where you couldn't get the layers forming very well. So what affects the polymer's ability to form Good alternating layers and I think it's so it's uh, it really depends on the couple of polymer you are using and yeah. uh, when you reach this thickness of layers it will become uh, harder and harder to keep the homogeneity because uh, when you have a layer of 25 nanometer it's uh, really difficult to uh, to obtain for all the sample uh, really uh, yeah uh, homogeneous uh, layer. And we can find that also in the literature. They often at this level, there is, this, there is some struggle to, to keep this homogeneity. What size scale are you working on? Like how, how big a membrane do you normally? Oh, make? it's really, it's huge because uh, in fact, it, uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't know how, how many meters, but uh, so the, 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 the larger is, um, is maybe 10 centimeter but the length is really huge. Uh, but in fact, it's the thickness which is important. And the thickness is around one, uh, 150 micrometer. Okay, so you're actually using like a industrial scale extruder. Okay, wow, cool. Um, yeah. Of course. Um... Hi, folks on Zoom. I had a question about the, that extruder. That that is like a roller type extruder or a normal 
like PLA wire type extruder. Can you can you describe a little bit how that those look like? I have no idea. I've never seen one of those. So just you have uh, two part of uh, extruders, and you have a uh, like you you put your pellets of PLA and PA eleven, and at the end you you will have the uh, the the film. And... Already comes in a sheet, right? Yeah. I yeah. See. So not and not you have a a, something to roll. Roll it, yeah. To roll the, the film. And the and the and when you said that you're controlling for the thickness of the layers before you do the multipliers, it's at the rollers that do that. No, no, it's the uh, the multipliers will be uh, before. Oh, before. And, okay, okay. Now it makes more sense. Got it. Thank you. Um, any other questions? So I'm still trying to imagine how this extruder works. I've never done old school polymer chemistry, so I've never seen an extruder in action. So you, you have pellets yeah. and it melts the pellets. You, and... and you have a, a screw mm -hmm. which, which will add in, which will conduct the different polymer. Mm -hmm. And the, you, the, um, with the, you, have, you can also increase the temperature. Mm -hmm. Like this, uh, you, you will have a, a, a look, liquid flux nearly. Uh, and uh, and after that, you have the multiplying elements. Okay, All right. Um, and then when you're testing the uh, the permeability of your humongous membranes, so it's like, just a small part. Oh, okay. So you chop up a small yeah. part and then measure. Yeah. Uh, measure the permeability that way. Okay. Cool. Ah, uh, yeah. This is probably a stupid question, but uh, you talked about the glass uh, uh, structure and rubber structure or something. Yeah. So um, what are these? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not so, a chemist at all. <laughs> yeah, in polymer, you have a, a, you, in fact, all polymer as an amorphous can be amorphous and some of them can crystallize. So, and the amorphous, uh, polymer uh, will have the ability, the chain will have the ability to move a little bit. And uh, the temperature at which it can move, we call that the glass transition temperature. And so uh, when the polymer is able to crystallize, you have the formation of crystals. And here you have the for this part you will have the fusion the melting temperature, so crystals will melt, but the amorphous part will have this what we we are calling the glass transition temperature. That's yeah, so the rubber is uh, after the glass transition temperature, and uh, the glassy part is before the glass transition temperature. It's uh, as we call these two part before the glass transition temperature and after the glass transition temperature. Um, oh, I think Florian has a question. <laughs> um, I just have a question. I saw you had some nice picture, like on slide nine, you have cross, cross section of the, of the membrane. <clears throat> like, do you use those images for uh, only for qualitative result, or do you also using for characterizing the no, like? Do you measure things on the image or some properties to? So no, in fact, uh, both. Uh, we are using using it to know what kind of structure uh, we have uh, for the uh, for the porous part because if we don't cut it, we don't know if it's like sponge like or uh, finger like. Yeah, but so that's. And that's so something that, you do qualitatively. So you just cut it. You me uh, you measure something, or you just see and say, okay, this is sponge-like, and that's this there type. Is, yeah, different aspects. For for, the, for example, for asymmetric membrane, we will use it to to know the thickness of the dense part, and uh, and to see. So that's what we can measure, and here we can see if the pores are interconnected or not. So there is not a lot really measurement because to know the size of the pores, we will use this kind of image and much 
larger. And like this, we can know the, the, the both sides. But here we will uh, uh, just know the, the kind of structure of pores, if it's interconnected, and the size of uh, the, the thickness of the dense part for the asymmetric membrane. I guess if you have many of those images that have been uh, labeled by some users, you could kind of try to learn that and, and do it automatically and do again some machine learning. I have a lot of <laughs> Thank you. Um, back at the... I'm, I'm also not a chemist, I should say. <laughs> and and, and I, I do some wearable devices where we use films sometimes hydrogels or sometimes conductive electrodes and things like that. But I've never thought of dynamically changing the, the porous porosity of a, of a polymer or something like that. And you showed that. And I remember you saying something along the lines of you switch from the thermal approach to the UV or the light-based approach for speed. Um, but maybe I missed it. How fast can you switch? And is it asymmetric? Does it take more time when it relaxes back? Because I think you don't do another light to switch it back, right? You just wait for it to re recoil. So it depends. So uh, for the, uh, so it will depend on different uh, aspects. It will depend on the environment where the polymer uh, will be. If it's, uh, if it is in a solvent, it will be faster. If it's in water, the water will absorb UV. So uh, it will be uh, slower, a little bit slower, but it's working. It's working. Uh, to, um, uh, to switch to trans to cis uh, is quite uh, quick, depending on the environment. For, of course, in powder, uh, it's, uh, it will be longer because uh, it is a chain will have uh, less mobility. Uh, but to, uh, to uh, uh, switch to cis to trans is longer. Uh, you can use, you can let it like this. If it's in the dark, it will take maybe several days. Uh, if it's uh, if you're using visible light, and you can uh, use uh, like uh, I don't know the, the room lamp uh, directly on the, the polymer, it will uh, go faster. And you could you uh, you you can you use also the temperature, and of course with the temperature it will. Uh, it will go faster to uh, to the trans configuration, but honestly, I didn't uh, do the calculation for this one. Thank you. Very cool. Okay. Um, any other questions for Louise? Great. Well, if not, uh, thank you so much for the very educational talk about membranes. Uh, thank you. <laughs>